Drugs rolling off the production line in India, one of the world's biggest suppliers of generic medicines. For over a decade, India has been the powerhouse behind low-cost drugs for the developing world, especially Africa and Asia. India's $4.5 billion pharmaceutical industry is now at a crossroads, following a new law introduced in January 2005. It's opened a highly charged debate, with opinion split right down the middle. Life has been to India to investigate. Bringing in the harvest in Pune, a poor remote rural area in southwest India. It's in villages like this, and in similar communities around the world, where the change in India's drug patent law is going to have the most impact. Some people don't have jobs. When you're ill, you have to decide what you're going to spend the money on. Do you eat? Do you spend it on education? Or do you spend it on medicines? These medicines are still expensive for poor people. These are not packaged medicines, they are loose tablets. The medicines are in different colors. Yellow for diarrhea, for fever or a cold, white tablets, so people can recognize the right tablet. Companies put labels and packaging on them, and that is why the pricing is higher. Poor families like these certainly benefited from India's historic 1970 drug patent law, which granted patents on the process rather than the product. This means drug companies in India could legally produce medicines that had been researched and introduced by international firms simply by a slight change in the process. They could sell them at half the price, but still make big profits. The head of one generic drug company says the new law will undermine the production of low-cost drugs and people will die as a result. What did Indira Gandhi say in 1981 at the WHO? That there should be no patenting of life and death and medicines should be free of patents. She said that in 81. Why isn't the government of India following her ideals today? It's not just a question of Indian consumers, Indian patients be, being denied of new drugs. It's also a question of many poor African and Asian countries being denied drugs that were coming from India at much lower costs. What do the international drug companies whose business interests are going to be better protected under the new law say to that? Will this change mean, as the new law comes into force, that the supply of affordable drugs to the world's poor is about to come to an end? Certainly not. In fact, on the contrary, uh, you will be mortgaging the future for the present. By destroying patents, you'll discourage research. You'll also ensure that for our children and our children's children, we do not have the drugs for the future diseases. And that will be the real killer. Neither, according to Mr. Shahani, does this mean the end of the road for generic drug companies. Two-thirds of Indians, he argues, still have no access to medicines, and that is a huge untapped domestic market. If you look at the future for generic companies in India, uh, there is potential both in the domestic market as well as the global market. If you take Indian opportunity, uh, today only 35% of the population has access to medicine that we know. So there is a potential population of 65% which needs to be access, have access to medicine. So these generic companies, provided there are good delivery systems available, can access this. And this is over 700 million people. So there's a domestic demand-led opportunity here. It certainly is not going to spell the death knell for generic companies, including, including CIPLA. 
The government also defends the change in the drug patent law, not least because it will help improve India's own research and development into new drugs. Now, with having a product patent regime, it gives the people of India access uh, to the highest quality medicines in the world. It gives the people, of, it gives the Indian industry uh, a comfort that their own research and development will be rewarded. And at the end of the day, we must build up with one billion people. We need to build up our own industry. The recent history of drug patents in India has had a significant impact on world health. The 1970 Act, with the patent emphasis being on process rather than product, revolutionized production. It mushroomed, and the competition between companies drove prices down. 80% of the drugs in the Indian market are made by Indian companies. And not only that, your manufacturing capability has uh, increased to the level where you can export to so many countries. Indian industry in the pharmaceutical sector is the fourth largest in the world. Uh, in no other manufacturing sector does the Indian industry have that kind of position. Now clearly this was uh, something that the 1970 Patents Act allowed uh, and helped uh, happen. At the time, this was politically important for India. The country wanted to be independent and self-sufficient in a number of key areas, including drugs. But because it was so easy to copy drugs with a simple change in the process, critics labelled it the copycat drug industry. There were drugs and pharma industry grew by copying. Any time a new molecule came from US or Europe, uh, within 18 months to two years, it will be copied here and production will start because of our strength in process chemistry and process engineering. That is how our industry grew. Does that mean the generic Indian drugs companies are guilty of simply ripping off the ideas and hard work of the major international manufacturers? Brian Tempest, head of Ranbaxy, another of India's generic drug firms, says his company always likes to make the most of business opportunities but never breaks the law. We uh, don't uh, do anything that's illegal. If uh, there is uh, no patent, then we will sell our products. If there is a patent which has a big hole in it, we'll go to court and uh, find a way around that, to uh, invalidate that patent or demonstrate that we don't infringe that patent by taking a chemical route that goes all the way around the patent. But we don't do anything illegal, uh, but we do look for uh, market opportunities where patents don't, aren't present and therefore we can enter the market. As a result, many multinational pharmaceutical companies simply pulled out of India, leaving the local companies to dominate the market. Indian companies were also free to experiment with all sorts of generic drugs copied from their Western counterparts. It led to some major medical breakthroughs. The most spectacular came in 2001, when the generic manufacturer Cipla produced its famous triple drug cocktail therapy for HIV patients. This was possible only because under Indian patent law, Cipla could combine different drugs into one pill. Before that, HIV patients needed to take about 20 different tablets, all controlled by individual patents. With the triple drug cocktail, it was easier to take, and most important, it was much cheaper. In the question of affordability and feasibility of antiretroviral therapy, we've seen a miracle in the last five years, the like of which we've never seen, I think, in medical or public health history. Five years ago, antiretroviral therapy cost 20 to 30,000 US dollars per patient per year and involved taking 20 to 30 pills per day. Immensely expensive and immensely complicated and difficult to comply with. Today, antiretroviral therapy under the best circumstances costs about $150 per patient per year and involves taking two pills per day, one in the morning and one in the evening, and they're the same pill, and each pill contains three different drugs. Now that is a revolution, the like of which we've never seen. WHO made a statement that in the world today, one million people are being treated for HIV. 
although six and a half million should be treated, only one million are being treated. And you'll be interested to know that Cipla's drugs, Triamune and Duovir N, are currently being used by 250,000 people worldwide. The seed which led to the change in India's drug patent law was sown in 1995, when India joined the World Trade Organization. One of the conditions of joining the WTO was that India had to change its drug patent law and move more into line with the rest of the world, i.e. move from the process-based patent law to a products-based system. Ultimately, this will mean an end to the low-cost copycat drugs. Many in the industry fear this will mean monopolies being created and patent holders having total control over pricing. It will be good for the people who manufacture these drugs, for the big uh, multinationals, for all the big companies, it's very good because they'll simply have monopolistic you know, trade practices. They are the only ones making one particular drug. They are the only ones you know, uh, setting the price for it. Whoever's life depends on that drug has to buy it or die, you know. This leaves the Indian government walking a tightrope. On the one hand, they want to encourage pharmaceutical innovation, but they also need to make sure drugs stay affordable for the many. Obviously, a person who holds a patent is entitled to a return. Not just a return, but a fair return on his investment, right? At the same time, a person who is the user of the drug uh, and who doesn't have the economic capacity to pay is also entitled to the use of that drug, right? And it's not that there is a mismatch between the two. I think parties at both ends have to move together. We at our end to give him as good a return as possible. And they at that end to ensure that the drug is available uh, to the poor at affordable prices. Ironically, for the country that pioneered affordable drugs, the rising price of medicines comes at a time when India may be about to need them more than ever before. India may be on the brink of a health disaster. The HIV AIDS pandemic uh, is a global problem. Today, it's most serious in Southern Africa. But the epicenter, the center of gravity, is moving to Asia inexorably. And the two biggest epidemics in the world are very likely to become India and China. So India has a huge need to try and curtail and avert now what is a rapidly expanding and serious epidemic among one billion people. If true, the Indian government's response is not encouraging. There is no health crisis as such in India. See, compared to other countries, you see the prevalence rate. India, for a lot of diseases, is much, much lower than most other countries. But due to the sheer population, the numbers are there. But the prevalence is, example, uh, HIV. The prevalence of HIV in the country is just 0.91%, where the prevalence rate in South Africa is 23%, Zimbabwe is 26%, Botswana is 37%, and from some neighboring countries like Thailand was at one time 16%. So compared to that, India is just 0.9%, is just nothing. For over 15 years, India has been largely self-sufficient as a manufacturer of generic pharmaceuticals. Low costs means it's also been a major supplier of affordable drugs to the rest of the developing world. But following changes to India's patent law, can that continue? The main battleground will be over the development of future drugs as multinational companies begin to re-establish research and development operations in India. The Indian government believes the country's cheap research expertise is what will attract them. Drug research has become extremely expensive. Now we talk about up to 15 years to put a molecule into the marketplace. We talk about $1.5 billion. I mean, that is going to be unaffordable, uh, even not just for poor in India, but even the rich in the USA. And therefore, companies will be always striving to lower costs 
while maintaining quality and excellence. And I believe India is the destination. But the head of CIPLA, the company responsible for the revolutionary AIDS triple cocktail drug, says against the multinationals, Indian companies will find it almost impossible to compete. Please understand that a company like CIPLA, we invested, say, $20 million in so-called R&D last year. Pfizer invested $7 billion in R&D. How can I compete? Do you know what is the R&D budget of India? India's R&D budget, public sector, private sector, all industries, space, aeronautics, everything, last year was $3 billion. Pfizer alone in drugs last year was $7 billion. Where is, you know, give us a level playing field. To really compete, some Indian drug companies are joining forces with the global giants. For example, Ranbaxy, a big Indian firm, has teamed up with GlaxoSmithKline. Ranbaxy argues the change to the drug patent law is the best way forward. They ask, if companies can't benefit from their discoveries, where is the incentive? Are patents important to uh, drug discovery? Well, I think uh, that, um, you know, at the end of the day, people invest in R&D because they want to get a return from it. And it's a high risk and it's a high return. And therefore, you do need that intellectual property in order to um, generate an incentive to invest in R&D of medicines. So I think it's quite likely that there would not be the sort of breakthroughs of medicines if there wasn't a, a, an era of intellectual property protection. High risks and high returns are obvious concerns for the drug manufacturers. But what about the patients? Financially, they are faced with making huge sacrifices. We have many patients whose families sell off their whole house or land even to get them treated. Despite the fact that we keep telling them, don't do this, because cancer patients, you never can be sure whether they'll live or not. If the government does intervene, then they may ensure that drugs prices do not go beyond a certain limit. But whether government will be able to do that or not, we don't really know. But the government commitment is pretty clear. They will provide low-cost medicines for those that need them. As far as health care is concerned, uh, this country is committed to supplying drugs at affordable prices to the poor. If we can't do that, then we, we cannot possibly claim to have taken care of the concerns that the poor have. But those actually working in the health system have doubts about that commitment. India's track record, they say, does not stand up to close scrutiny. Instead of increasing its investment in health, the government is actually pulling out. The WHO recommended expenditure on health is 6% of GDP. At this point, India spends 0.9% of its GDP on health. This is affecting the poor. How come then the drugs become so expensive that they are not available for the common person? When we are talking of patents and we are talking of product patents, who are the people that we are talking about? Who's going to get wiped out? There are also those who seriously question the assumed link between the new patent system and the development of new drugs. One of the world's leading authorities on intellectual property says evidence suggests patents do not always lead to breakthroughs. Indeed, he says it's possible they hinder innovation rather than encourage it. There is a significant um, academic work showing that in many cases patents may block rather than promote innovation. Patents have become stronger, but in fact the innovation is declining in a very substantial manner. In some cases, sharing of knowledge will lead to more innovation than appropriation of knowledge. If you promote competition, then prices will uh, go down. If you restrict competition on the basis of a patent system, then you have a problem. Professor Correa also points out big drug companies have to answer to their shareholders. They must make a profit. And that usually means 
working on drugs people want and can afford. Clearly, investment by multinational companies in research and development is focused on diseases that affect the rich people. Um, they are not uh, interested in uh, investment in uh, diseases that prevail in developing countries because there they haven't got a significant market. What concerns senior health experts is that the change in the drug patent law could have a serious impact on India's ability to deliver on the Millennium Development Goals. Well, the relationship between the Indian patent law and the MDGs potentially um, has to do with whether the Indian patent law turns out to have a negative effect on access to low-priced antiretrovirals. If it does turn out to have a negative effect on access to low-cost antiretrovirals, then it will very seriously and adversely affect the achievement of the Millennium Development Goals. Because turning around HIV AIDS and TB and malaria, by the way, is a central and important Millennium Development Goal on which a number of other Millennium Development Goals rest. You can't achieve the education goal if your school teachers are dying of HIV AIDS faster than they're being trained, as is the case in a number of Southern African countries today. There's also an issue about the social value of drugs currently under development. Today, it's more about curing baldness or improving sexual performance because that's what people in rich countries want and can afford. Drugs for killer diseases don't bring in quite so much money. I think for me it's frightening that 10 or 12 people today are deciding what are the kind of drugs that need to be researched because clearly those drugs are being researched not because of the health needs but based on how much profits they can, they can bring in. That's why you have research money going into drugs for baldness or Viagra but the last drug for tuberculosis was developed something like 30 years back. When you deny people cars or washing machines they don't die. When you deny people uh, drugs they die and they die in millions. But the head of Novartis in India points out that his company should not be expected to invest in developing drugs that won't make money. India has over 35 million diabetic patients, another 35 million non-diagnosed, 70 million patients. And today we do not have heat-resistant insulin, which means insulin cannot be transported into the interior, or if it is transported, it is ineffective. So there has to be encouragement to do some research to make heat insulin res insulin. Now, if this is not being rewarded or it's not patentable, nobody will go in that direction because innovation has to be rewarded. But regardless of business plans and making profits, India is now going to need affordable drugs like never before. Will they get them? Please understand what is the disease pattern in India today. There are 80 million cardiac cases, 110 million mental health cases, 60 million diabetics, 50 million asthmatics, 50 million hepatitis B cases. One in three Indians has got latent TB. The World Bank themselves have said that India by 2015 will have 35 million HIV positive cases approximately half that in, in the world. Do you sincerely believe that we can afford a monopoly? It will take some time before the true effect of this important change in the Indian patent drug law can be properly assessed. It's also a key test for the Indian government in its commitment to providing medical care especially in the face of an expected increase in the number of HIV AIDS cases. Meanwhile though, how to supply those who need low-cost drugs the most is a matter that now hangs in the balance.